welcome back to the show. We are live now in the studio, full sofa, packed out mm -hmm. with the executive leader of climate change for GEMS Education, Azila Sadiki, the 10 year old student representing. Thank you very much for being here. And Asha Alexander. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. So tell us more about what GEMS Education is doing with climate change and uh, COP28. We're doing a lot. We've just had a climate conference last evening which was attended by the UNITAR's director, Angus Mackay, and we're hosting SCOPE, the School Conference of Parties Expo, for students to debate and discuss climate action. I don't think enough of students get a platform for sharing their views. So we're taking this for its closing plenary to the Greening Hub at Expo. That's wonderful. And Eliza, so you're here as the student. Right. How is that for you? I mean, it's amazing because it's an opportunity for the youth to get more involved in the discussions happening in COP28, to start showing their perspective on the various issues because in the end, we're gonna be the next generation that's gonna take over the various jobs and roles that we have right now that politicians are taking over. So it's important for us to be more involved in those discussions to understand what's happening and to show our voice in what we're understanding and how the adults can help us and how we can help the adults in turn. Mm. I, I mean, I would love to know, when, when you see these important, serious politicians, do you take them seriously? <laughs> I mean, honestly, from the youth perspective, yeah, we respect every adult we have in front of us. But then, of course, sometimes it's not as important for us because we're trying to be more involved in those discussions. So more respect would come if we can be in those discussions with you and share our voices and our perspectives because we believe that we're just as capable of understanding what's happening as an adult. Mm. It's so great to see young people getting involved in the climate change debate. And I was in COP28 on Tuesday and I noticed in the blue zone, there weren't many young people. They were more my age group. There's a lot of older men. Yeah. And it's great to see young people engaged. Within your school, do you see the change coming from the teachers or do you see it from the students upwards? Where's that change coming from? Are you driving the agenda or are the teachers driving the agenda? I mean, it works hand in hand because the teachers educate the students on climate change. Oh, you should recycle this. Oh, you should upcycle this. Oh, you know, plastic shouldn't go in the plastic bin. But then, of course, that change in that behavior comes from the students who are willing to implement those actions. So, for example, um, last two weeks ago, we ran the Gems with the COP28 conference, which is a completely student-led initiative. We had a school sustainability council made completely of students, and we thought it'd be great to have this initiative where we can invite students to actually play those roles as delegates to start imagining what decisions and solutions they can come up to. So of course the teachers, they teach us these habits and they try to enforce it and tell us about what's happening, but it's the students who have the will to implement those ideas and start working on their own as well. Fabulous. Now, Asha, I have a question for you. Now we could tell from what is saying, there's a lot of initiative from the students. From the school's perspective, how can you incorporate more of these things in the regular day in the classroom, other than just having a separate conversation about COP and then suddenly another subject about this? How can it be part of a full day to make sure sustainability is incorporated in their day? We've already incorporated it, integrated it into the curriculum in all of the subjects. Our teachers, 5,500, are the first in the world to be skilled up by UNCC Learn. They have been certified as climate change teachers at GEMS Education. So all of our schools are going to have climate literacy embedded. And to answer James's question, both the top down and the bottom up approach has to be implemented. Children can't wait for someone else to rescue them. Neither can we wait for leaders to mandate changes, but both should go hand in hand to close that gap. So we are doing our bit in surveying students, trying to find out if they're interested in climate change, where do they want us to provide uh, additional information for them. We surveyed students in 44 GEM schools and more than 12,000 students responded to the survey. Wow. And uh, they were already aware and optimistic of the changes that had come about, but they certainly want to learn about climate change. And I think there we are aligned with the UAE's Ministry of Education, which is bringing about this change and wanting to embed climate literacy in the curriculum. That's incredible. You talked about a survey and you went out to what, 5,000 students? 12,000. 12,000 students. Yeah. Did anything come back that surprised you? What were the key learnings from that survey? The key learnings, I think, was that students are still holding leaders accountable. The message to leaders was do better. But I would ask students, what is it that we can do better while we wait for our leaders to take action? 
because when we do not choose to lead, we are being led. And I think when we lead, we take the responsibility for change into our own hands. So students have said they have seen behavioral changes, which is wonderful as far as I can see. The fact that they recognize that their behaviors have changed on account of the opportunities provided to them at GEMS. I love that. Um, Eliza, I do have one last question for you because we spoke about it earlier, which was the importance of social media in educating the younger right. generation, right? And, you know, there's so many layers to educating uh, each generation. I think step outside of the classroom, it's all in what you consume as well when you're at home, when you're out and about. So, have you seen a lot of social media content swayed towards educating on the, on the climate change level? Right, of course. I feel like students and peers and of course, Generation Z are one of the biggest media takers of social media. And because of social media, they're able to understand and take in what's being taught. And so that includes the environment, that includes plastics. I remember that one trend where everyone's like, particularly in my grade as well, they just reject the idea of plastic bags. And if you took plastic bags, it wasn't thought as cool or you weren't thought as you're in the modern time or era. So at that time it was tote bags and that's sort of encouraged proper positive behavior towards reducing the climate change and the impacts it has on our seas. And then of course we hear so much about like the icebergs melting. We hear about the animals that are getting affected. And because of social media, that information was relayed back to different students. And it sort of created this domino effect where more students were aware of what's happening. More of the Generation Z were fair, aware of the impacts that are happening. And because of that, they were able to change their behaviors because you learn from someone your age and, and that's social media for you. Yeah, I wow. love that because I remember back in London and uh, a friend would come round and uh, we're having a party or something and he'd bring round some food or whatever in a, in a bag and it would be someone would bring a paper bag and whoever brings a plastic bag, you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, you look down <laughs> on cheap. them. just cheap. You look down on them. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's so true. It's just not cool. <laughs> it's like, well, that's good to know that it's passed down in generations <laughs> yeah, as well. Right, exactly. uh, I want to thank you, Asha, for being here. Thank you so much for your time. And Elisa, I guess if, if the next generation is in your good hands, then the whole world is in safe hands Indeed, as well. So thank so. you. Thank you both Absolutely. so much thank you so for much. your time. Now, Ash went down to a Prototypes for Humanity, which is the world's largest gathering of academic talent and innovation to take a look at what some of the student projects are all about in binding environmental sustainability and social well-being. Take a look. I'm at Prototypes for Humanity 2023 and I'm really looking forward to seeing some incredible projects and innovations by young university students from all across who have been working really hard to come up with solutions to tackle some of the issues we face today. Uh, Wissam, you're here representing the UAE and you've been chosen among the 3,000 different applications that have been sent in for this event. What is it like to be chosen? Oh, it's an amazing feeling, like to be here among all these prestigious universities among the world. So, like, I'm, I'm so excited, Yanni. I'm with Rand and Suad, two very energetic and excited designers here at Prototypes for Humanity. Their project is called Battery, correct? Can you tell us a little bit more about it, Suad? Yes, of course. So basically what our project is about is uh, essentially what we wanted to do was to be able to harness micro wind patterns within the UAE and eventually generate electricity from it. But you're coming up with so many innovative solutions to tackle the problem of plastic. But what is it that you have to say to the average consumer such as myself when it comes to our consumption of plastic and how we choose to dispose it responsibly? This is a very good point. One of the challenges that we sometimes face in our process when people actually combine uh, different types of waste like plastic with uh, textiles with organic uh, waste. So we will be so much um, actually uh, in a better position if we can get all these plastic waste just combined under plastic waste. And that's what everyone can just have a contribution towards like the uh, uh, pollution of plastic by providing us just separating the type like the plastic from other types of organic waste like food uh, or from other types of uh, glass or other types of waste that will enable us just to start the process and will reduce also uh, the price to convert the plastic into these precious materials. 
What is the importance for the youth of today to take responsibility to tackle the issue of climate change and just live more sustainably? This is very crucial. This is one of the things that uh, all the youth can, should do it. Uh, it's very important to kind of uh, live sustainable and renewable lifestyle. Um, you know, address the challenges um, in, in, in our daily life, you know, um, in terms of recycling, waste management, uh, using renewable energy. And youth, they have the kind of voice now as an innovator and as a researcher. It is very important and they are playing very important role at, at this moment, you know, uh, especially during this, this time, you know, they, they are really playing a very crucial role. This year, prototypes for humanity have shown us so many innovative ways to address the different problems we face with environmental sustainability and social well-being. From one project to another, it is clear that there are some incredible innovations coming our way. Nice one, Ash, and a wonderful initiative. I heard the winner got $100,000. So right now, it's time for our daily roundup. Lovely Louis, what is the dilly? Well, if you're into cycling, this is going to sound impressive. A cyclist said that he felt climate change on his body on an 8,800 kilometer ride from Germany all the way to right here to COP28. Michael Everts, a 64 year old, completed a solo expedition across 13 countries to raise climate awareness. And his mission is to highlight the urgency of addressing environmental issues and highlight the fast rise of temperature. He continues his journey as he leaves COP28 at the end of the event, and then he cycles on to Cairo through 17 more countries as well. Oh my goodness. That sounds tiring. 13, another 17. <laughs> But of course, for a good cause. No, it's wonderful. Um, we had um, Paula Jacobson on yesterday and they're doing the first event which is actually incorporating the sea. Uh, it's like a paddle out event, which is nice. So, so anything that um, adds the physical activities and you're, you're bringing the environment into it, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful mm. way. James, does Live Nation do any live active kind of events that are outside of concerts or is that something that you guys would maybe consider doing where we can all get together in a stadium and and do something for a cause yeah we do well we've been involved in many causes over the years some of the mm. biggest events in history of course were yeah. live events live eight being one live aid in uh, 20 years later so we get involved in all of those but you know engaging people in this conversation is key to success it's key to the change yeah um, in our business we try to get everyone involved so whether you're in finance marketing sales everyone has a role to play in in terms of highlighting climate change and making those differences mm, absolutely what Michael is doing is just giving me Forrest Gump vibes <laughs> yeah. you know like the people so really true. coming together because they you're rooting for an individual but it's for a great cause and you know running behind him I would do it if I could he but I'm curious miles. if there's like a big group of cyclists right behind it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely not for me, but good luck to Michael. So much going on in the city and here's what else is coming up on today's show. We went down to witness the climate musical Alia in Terraland at COP28. Yep, and we caught up with the authors of the book Mission Zero to discuss how to really combat climate change with the younger generation. Plus, we've got a country singer at the end of the show. It's all very exciting. Stay right there. <laughs> 